our time and spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, this two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I am your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thank you to our generous underwriters on Sharper Iron, the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. And Luther Classical College, a college for Lutherans by Lutherans, opening in fall 2025. Learn more at lutherclassical.org. On this Thursday, August 4th, we are studying Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 1 to 23. Moses' first sermon in Deuteronomy continues. He recounts the wilderness wanderings of Israel, particularly in the regions of some of their relatives. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Ryan Agrotowitz. Pastor Agrotowitz serves as associate pastor and headmaster at Grace Lutheran Church and School in Brenham, Texas. Pastor Agrotowitz, welcome back to Sharper Iron. Thank you, Pastor Apple. It's good to be here as always. As we get started today, Pastor Agrotowitz, let's talk context. What should we know as we prepare to look at this first part of Deuteronomy chapter 2? Deuteronomy works best when you know the story of the Exodus as told to us in the book of Exodus, and um, many of those details show up also in the book of Numbers. Deuteronomy means second law, or, or maybe second teaching might be a little bit of a better translation. And so it's recapping what the Christian reader has already heard in Exodus and Numbers. Leviticus, is, you know, I would, I would say that book is a little bit of a different animal, focusing more on the, uh, the worship life of the people. Um, but certainly in terms of the big major historic events of Israel's wanderings in the desert, her departure from Egypt, making her way to the promised land, Deuteronomy begins moving very quickly. So um, I would encourage you know, Christian readers to, to know Exodus well, know Numbers well. Then when you get into to Deuteronomy and you start uh, studying it, a, a lot of these, these, um, these recaps that we're getting on the front end of the book uh, will, make, will make a lot of sense. There's a reason why it's moving quickly because the Holy Spirit is reiterating what we've already heard. And uh, we, we can't have reiteration of the Word of God too much because we're always quick to forget what our Lord has said. So that's just one comment about the book itself. And of course, there are, there are plenty of new things in Deuteronomy as well. It's not just a repeat uh, by any stretch. You know, it's going to, uh, to be the book that segues into the great book of Joshua. So the mantle will pass from Moses to Joshua. Moses dies. And of course, we know he doesn't make it into the, uh, the, the physical promised land, so to speak. He will die and go uh, to be with his Lord. But we do see that nice segue into Joshua, and he will be the one who brings the people into uh, the great land that God has been promising. Now, in terms of like context in the text, there, there are uh, you know, two things that have happened that are a big deal before going into chapter two. Uh, one, Israel is not entering the land. So this is before God tells them, hey, you're going to wander in the desert 40 years. Uh, the spies are sent. There are 12 spies sent, one from each tribe. And, uh, you know, most Christian readers, I would suspect, know this story. Um, all but Caleb and Joshua bring a bad report. And so the Lord... Uh, for their for the disobedience and really rejection of the promise, God is going to give them the penalty of having to wander around in the desert for 40 years. And a good chapter that really goes into the details there would be Numbers 14. So mm -hmm. the penalty has been laid forth. The spies, they have failed their job. They spread a bad report amongst the people, even though it is a fruitful land. Caleb and Joshua are the only two who are really holding strong and fast. We can do this. We can take this. But, you know, the majority, I mean, what do they say? Majority rules and the, 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 uh, the, the, the spies who don't want to go in, man, they send a bad report. And this, this, uh, raises the ire of God towards his people. Deuteronomy 134 says, The Lord heard your words and was angered, and he swore not one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land. So when the people hear that, there is a contingent of the Israelites that decide, you know what, okay, we made a mistake, we sinned, all right, we're going to go take the land. 
And so they, they get very eager all of a sudden, and they're going to rise up in arms and go and try and take the land. And it's, it's a failure. They go without Moses. They go without God. They go without the ark. And, you know, as, as you can probably figure just by me talking, even if you don't know the story, they fail. They go in for the wrong reasons, and they are driven out by the Amalekites and the Canaanites who live there. And it's a, it's a failed excursion. Uh, so those are, those are some things that are taking us into uh, the wilderness years of chapter 2. So, yeah, as you said, this is Deuteronomy can be translated something like second law, or I think second teaching is that we want to go with teaching probably more here, because as we're seeing in this section of Deuteronomy, particularly, we're not dealing with, quote, law in a very strict sense, but we're dealing with the word of God, the teaching of the word of God. And and we should probably understand that second doesn't mean that it's somehow different from, from what was recorded previously but rather the Lord is repeating what this new generation needs to hear. And, and I think that's part of, you know, as, as you mentioned, you can go back into Numbers 14, and it's very helpful to know what's come previously in the books of Moses, because you get a more full account or just different details than what Moses gives here. And I think as, as, you, know, as you look at what Moses does give here in this, what, what I've been calling a sermon or an address or something like that, you see some of his own strategy as a preacher in how he wants this sermon to affect this new generation. Some of whom, as we said in, in previous shows, maybe weren't alive at the times or at the during the time of the events recounted. Perhaps they were born afterwards. But he wants them to hear it so that they're equipped to go into the promised land, believing rather than unbelieving as the generation that has died in the wilderness. Sure, yeah. So one note about the uh, the law stuff we were talking about. Oftentimes when you're reading your Bibles in the Old Testament, you will see the word law come up when um, the Hebrew word for that oftentimes is Torah, which means really something uh, fuller than just law, but the teaching, the entire word of God that can be, of course, law and gospel. And we see both law and gospel in the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, hence, uh, you know, our suggestion that second teaching might be a more faithful rendering of, of Deuteronomy, namas meaning law, but probably I think teaching is is the gist of it here. But yeah, so uh, I, I love your comments about Moses being a preacher and wanting a younger generation to to understand what their forefathers did and didn't do that put them in a real mess of having to wander around the wilderness, namely rejecting the words and promises of God. And so, you know, in that vein, it makes sense to be a little simpler and maybe recap some things because, you know, when you're telling a story to a little kid, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to hit the bullet points. You're not going to dive into all the details, but you want them to get the gist of the story. And I think there is a thrust of that to Deuteronomy, um, you know, as Moses is transmitting this for the, the, the generations to come, you know, Here's what happened. The details are there in Numbers and Exodus, but you know, here's what happened, and and this is this, this is how this is how the people failed, and this is the generosity of God to continue providing for them even in the wilderness time, and uh, that that's a kind of a segue into chapter two, I think. Well, I, I think so because as we think about you know, we've been saying this is going to deal with the wilderness wanderings in the minds of many Christian readers, or at least in my mind as a Christian reader, when I think of the time of the wilderness wandering, what I think about is the grumbling of the people of Israel. They were always complaining about something, and, and the Lord had to show them his faithfulness. As we read the account that we have today in these first 23 verses of Deuteronomy chapter 2, the Moses doesn't really bring up their grumbling all that much. He brings up the Lord's faithfulness in leading, and we, we can talk about some of that, but it is I think that's maybe part of, we're going to see how Moses aims his sermon in a particular way to get at a particular point. He In this part, in this part of the sermon, it seems he's not really, he doesn't want the people to be focused on the grumbling that happened in the wilderness. We, we got the grumbling in the previous text at the end of chapter one. You you recounted it very well. In this part, he's moving him back toward the the faithfulness of God, even during that time of wilderness wandering. Yes. Uh, you know, all the grumbling passages, you know, it, 
it always makes for good preaching fodder when you're a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I think do about, people grumble in Brenham? <laughs> yeah, they, they, yes, they do grumble. It's the home of Bluebell. It, How could you grumble in Brenham? It, 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 it does happen. Yes. Uh, <laughs> despite having wonderful ice cream, we all do. We all do. Uh, and of course, in the New Testament, you know, when you hear a, te- a passage like the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, um, I'm going to submit the term grumble is a theological term. It means mm. something. It means somebody's horrible, bad response to God and his mercy, his gifts uh, in the New Testament, a grumbling against Christ and what he is saying. And for those passages in the Old Testament, you know, I, I tend to go to Exodus and, and there, you know, at least off the top of my head, that's where you have a lot of those passages of the people just um, complaining about the good things that God has given them even while they're in the desert and trying to provide for them. But here in chapter two, yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah, that, that's not the focus. That's not how Moses begins us. Let's go ahead and read then. We're in chapter two of Deuteronomy, beginning at the first verse. Then we turned and journeyed into the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea, as the Lord told me. And for many days we traveled around Mount Seir. Then the Lord said to me, you have been traveling around this mountain country long enough. Turn northward and command the people. You are about to pass through the territory of your brothers, the people of Esau, who live in Seir, and they will be afraid of you. So be very careful. Do not contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land. No, not so much as for the soul, as for the soul of the foot to tread on, because I have given Mount Seir to Esau as a possession. You shall purchase food from them for money that you may eat, and you shall also buy water of them for money that you may drink. For the Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. So we went on away from our brothers, the people of Esau, who live in Seir, away from the Arabah road, from Elath and Ezion Geber. And we turned and went in the direction of the wilderness of Moab. And the Lord said to me, Do not harass Moab or contend with them in battle. For I will not give you any of their land for a possession, because I have given Ar to the people of Lot for a possession. The Amim formerly lived there, a people great and many, and tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they are also counted as Rephaim, but the Moabites call them Amim. The Horites also lived in Seir formerly, but the people of Esau dispossessed them and destroyed them from before them and settled in their place, as Israel did to the land of their possession which the Lord gave to them. Now rise up and go over the brook Zered. So we went over the brook Zered. And the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zered was 38 years until the entire generation, that is the men of war, had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. For indeed the hand of the Lord was against them to destroy them from the camp until they had perished. So as soon as all the men of war had perished and were dead from among the people, the Lord said to me, Today you are to cross the border of Moab at Ar. And when you approach the territory of the people of Ammon, do not harass them or contend with them, for I will not give you any of the land of the people of Ammon as a possession, because I have given it to the sons of Lot for a possession. It is also counted as a land of Rephaim. Rephaim formerly lived there, but the Ammonites called them Zamzumim, a people great and many, and tall as the Anakim. But the Lord destroyed them before the Ammonites, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place, as he did for the people of Esau who live in Seir. When he destroyed the Horites before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place even to this day. As for the Avim, who lived in villages as far as Gaza, the Kaftarim, who came from Kaftor, destroyed them and settled in their place. That takes us through the end of our text. That's Deuteronomy 2, verses 1 to 23. I, I trust you're going to explain all of these names and peoples to us today, Pastor Agradowitz. You know, I did take time, and I have a yellow pad in front of me, and I, 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 <laughs> I did research the definitions of these names to the best of my ability by the grace and help of God. So I will do my best. and uh, God be praised yeah, for that. Meg- That's... <laughs> I, I beg- some of these names, I, I imagine we're not going to be able to say a whole lot about. There's going to be some that we know more about and some that we know less about, I, I'm, I'm imagining. Yeah, sure. And and yes, we'll, we'll get into that. I mean, I, I beg forgiveness for any of my shortcomings in this exercise. And um, yeah, and I was researching these names, I guess a good general comment. Yeah, yeah, for some you hear quite a bit and for some it's very little. 
I looked at a couple of different sources just to try to understand what's going on, because, I mean, the Holy Spirit is giving us these names for a reason. So as we unpack this text, um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pray the Lord gives me a faithful word on these names. And I, I think we'll find that for at least a handful of these names, uh, if you look at the Hebrew term behind them, uh, there's some theology there that's going to help us. Well, and even even without that, and I look forward to, to going through that with you, just to kind of give a general outline of this text. It, in general, we're working our way, and if you find you, it's help, we can't draw you a map here, but it's helpful to to find a good map of of the land of Israel and the surrounding regions at this time. The generally speaking, we're talking, we're going from south to north through the lands of Edom. Moab and Ammon. So, so that's what's happening geographically. The people of Israel are moving from Kadesh Barnea, which is in the, the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula, and they're going to start to go around to the, to the east side of the promised land, and they're going to kind of go through and around Edom, Moab, Ammon from north to south. So even if, if we don't know exactly everything, that's at least a general shape to this text. Yes, and I would encourage, if you're listening to this podcast or even studying an Old Testament text like this, having a map, a good map, is helpful. And even though, yes, we don't know exactly to the finest detail the route, we have a pretty good idea. And so you have Africa, and then you have the Sinai Peninsula. Right below that is the, um, well, it, the, the Gulf of Suez um, is, is between Africa and the Sinai Peninsula, and all this is below uh, the Great Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. So that's that's the area that we're looking at here. And I, I noticed here, at least on the map I have, remember I talked early on the front end about that excursion into the Promised Land very quickly when the people are just going to go in there and take it. It shows on my map, that's on the west side. Okay, right. Yeah, so they're going to try just to bump up there and take it. And of course, that doesn't happen. So um, yeah, that's what we're looking at. So Edom, Moab, Ammon, um, they, they've got some hostile territory to go through. And... Um, you know, this text is going to uh, to take us through that. So should we just start at the beginning? You want to go verse? By yeah, verse? let's. Yeah. So I think uh, the way you said it, I think is helpful. If, if the map that I'm looking at, too, has they would have attempted to take the, the promised land unsuccessfully without the Lord's promise by just kind of going straight north into Canaan. When that doesn't work, their their journey begins. And this is according to the Lord's direction. That's one of the things that Moses makes clear. They they turn and they go a different direction. So start taking us into their, their journeying. Sure. Well, that's important, too. The Lord told me. So Moses is being faithful to God's holy word. You know, and it, it you know, on the map, yeah, it looks like it would have been just so much easier to go this way, go on the west side. But God, you know, as we've talked about, he's He's going to make them wander. These are going to be a great, this is going to be a great teaching moment for the people of Israel um, as they wander through the wilderness. I also want to make a comment, you know, let, let's not, you know, as I'm sitting in my air-conditioned office here, sipping on water, and I have this nice technology, this was a harsh <laughs> environment. And just the word wilderness, we're talking desert arid this is a hard harsh place and so you know I, I had a nice healthy lunch these people man you know they they are dependent upon the mercy and provision of god so you know we, we should always try to keep that perspective in mind this is a harsh environment and they are dependent upon god's god's um provision as we all are only i think it is easy for us to lose sight of that because we live in a man a land where i mean food and water is just very abundant Okay, mm. so they, they, uh, they're they going to follow the Lord's direction here, and it says, For many days they travel around Mount Seir. Mount Seir is a mountainous region, and so while they're going around this region, that's when the Lord says, You've been going long enough, turn north. And Moses is told by God to command the people, You're going to pass through the territory of your brothers. Now that's interesting, too, language to call the people of Esau. So this is going to be the land of Edom. Okay, that's the land of uh, Esau. And also on the map I have here, it's called the Arabah. Sometimes you have different names for the same territory. Uh, but Esau is called brothers. And it, it, we're going to see something similar to for um, the people of Lot as well. And on that, I have a commentary here with this comment. This is from Colin Dalich. And he writes, uh, the Israelites were to uphold the bond of blood relationship with these tribes in the most sacred manner. So we know about Esau from Genesis, and the people are told, Israel is told, don't contend with them. Don't fight with them. They will be afraid of you. But the Lord tells them, be very careful. Um, 
that land of Edom is not for the Israelites. He, God has said it will belong to Esau. God is always faithful to keep his word. Um, I do think, too, this is an act of mercy of God to give land to the people of Esau. And, you know, he's not going to go back on his word. God is merciful to the just and the unjust. And so we see God's, you know, gracious provision, even to the heathen tribes, by giving them something here. It's land, and Israel is told not to take anything from them. They can purchase stuff with food, excuse me, with money. They can buy food if they wish and drink, um, but the land is off limits. Now, verse 7, here we get a verse, a proclamation of gospel. The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He knows you're going through this great wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you. You have lacked nothing. And then verse 8, so we went on away from our brothers, the people of Esau. Now that takes us through verse 8. But this idea of God knowing your way, the Lord takes that to a psalm. Excuse me, the Lord. I'm sorry. Luther, <laughs> forgive me. Luther compares that to a psalm. And uh, it's Psalm 1-6. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. And he writes uh, to say he knows your way or he knows your going. That's a Hebrew idiom. And I'm in, I'm in Luther's commentary on Deuteronomy. That, that's pretty easy to find um, to order if, if you want to dive into what he says about it. Um, but uh, Luther will go on to say, this is a word of outstanding comfort. And by it, faith is aroused. God has blessed you. God knows where you are going. Okay. So even though you may feel that you are lost or, or wandering about, God knows the path and he knows where you're going. I mean, you could, you can, I, I do think you can allegorize this faithfully in proclamation when you're serving your people, uh, at least make a comparison to our lives, because in our lives here and now, boy, it can feel like a wilderness. Maybe we're lacking things. We're forced into realizing our dependence upon God. We don't know where we're going or something like that. Hey, the Lord always knows the way of the righteous. I think Luther is quite brilliant to connect this idea of God knowing the way here in Deuteronomy 2. He connects that to Psalm. His psalm is Psalm 1, verse 6. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows the way of his people, Israel. He has blessed them. He's going to take care of them. And so there's no need for them to take matters into their own hands and think something like, you know, we can take we can take the Edomites. We can take them. We can take this land. Uh-uh. That land is theirs. But I have blessed you. I know where you're going, and, and I will be with you. Oh, a, lot, a lot of good things right there for us to, to digest and think about. It, it's very striking to me that Luther does compare Deuteronomy to, uh, particularly the verse seven. You know, he, as the ESV translates it, he knows you're going through this wilderness. And then to, to compare it to Psalm one, which again, verse six, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. But when you look at the rest of Psalm one and the way Psalm one talks about the righteous, the righteous being those who meditate upon the Lord's word and, and believe the Lord's word, they're called the the tree that's planted by streams of water and and yet it's that same idiom that's used here in the wilderness and and what a what a temptation it it surely was for the people of Israel as they were wandering through the wilderness to forget this goodness of the Lord who and what a what a wonderful way then for us to think about our lives when when we are wandering through a wilderness when when what we look at does not seem to be all that lush and green and great to know that the Lord knows our way, those eyes of faith, I mean, that really transforms our outlook so that we we don't look at the wilderness around us, but instead we we look at the the Lord who is actually knowing our way and leading us to oh, I'm gonna use Psalm 23 here, the the still waters and the, the green pastures. Yes, and it's a, it's always a temptation. You know, for any Christian, whether you're in the Bluebell country of Brenham, Smithville, <laughs> where, wherever you are, there is a temptation to despair and grumble. Uh, you know, let's use that word to grumble and complain mm -hmm. as we look around our surroundings and we make judgments about God's uh, e even his character based on what we see and what we feel instead of going to God's holy word, 
hearing what he has said and remembering his promises. I mean, this is one reason amongst many why Christians should not neglect going to hear the word of God every Sunday, a word that rouses us, a word that creates and sustains faith to, to, to once again, fix our eyes on his commandments and meditate on his precepts. You know, that's also Psalm language. Uh, you know, where, where are your eyes looking? And where, where is your heart? Where is your treasure? Well, for the Christian, we, we have an answer. Our hearts, um, by faith, are on Christ, and our treasure is one in heaven. And, you know, it's upon those things that faith faith looks upon. Uh, faith certainly receives the treasures and, and things of God in a world that is falling apart, a world that is filled with sin, sinful people. We feel the effects of those sins, but in the midst of it all, Hey, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows where we are going. He knows how we are going to get there. It's all in his hands, and we can take great comfort in that. Yeah, there's a wonderful promise here in Deuteronomy 2, repeated throughout the scriptures, Psalm 1. Great connection that Luther makes for us there. We're going to keep talking about Deuteronomy 2 on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron on KFUO. We're talking with Pastor Ryan Agrotowitz this morning. We will be right back. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. What do you think of when you hear the word college? Expensive? Liberal? Woke? Imagine a college that is affordable. A college that is unapologetically conservative and Lutheran. A college that won't take a dime of federal funding. A college that teaches the best of our Western heritage. A college where students grow in the Christian faith instead of leaving it behind. This is Luther Classical College. A college by Lutherans and for Lutherans. Visit our website, lutherclassical.org. Subscribe, become a patron, and join the thousands who are making Luther Classical College a reality. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, August 4th. We're studying Deuteronomy chapter 2, verses 1 to 23 with Pastor Ryan Agrotowitz. He is associate pastor and headmaster at Grace Lutheran Church and School in Brenham, Texas. Pastor Agrotowitz, prior to the break, we were beginning our conversation about the trip around and through a little bit the land of Edom, the, the children of Esau. And you made the point, as the Lord does, that the people of Israel are not to take this land because there's a different land for them. And because this land that they're passing through, actually the Lord has given to Edom, to Esau. Uh, we're going to see something similar when it comes to the other two groups of people that the the people of Israel had to pass around or through. What's the significance that the Lord is the one allotting the lands for people outside of Israel? Right. So the so I, I think we see in that, you know, God giving the land to these people. God cares about, he cares about these people, even though there's heathen. He does care about them. And the significance, I would say, is that the Lord is benevolent, kind, charitable. The Lord is a giver. And I think a comparison text, as I'm talking, this just kind of popped into my mind. But, you know, take like the Ninevites that Jonah has to go preach to. And that book yeah. ends with God saying, shall I not care about these people who don't know their right hand from their left? Of course he cares about them because God loves the whole world. I mean, he sends his son to die for the whole world. So to answer the question, the significance of the land going to even these people, God does care about them. And, you know, this land is for them. Now, of course, we always hope that such people will repent of their sin and turn to to, uh, the Lord, their God. And on that note, I'll add, uh, by the Israelites coming into this area, we cannot rule out the word of God hopefully coming with them. And the people in these territories hearing the word of God, perhaps, maybe, um, at least before the conquest of Joshua, when things get a lot more uh, intense and and even bloody as the battles ensue. So uh, I think I would answer that way. We see God's provision, and we also see an opportunity here for the people of Israel to really be evangelistic 
and take their word of the one true God, Yahweh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to these heathen people. I think what what the Lord says in verse 4 about the people of Esau being afraid of you, the people of Israel, is a reminder that, yes, the Lord's word is being and, and even has already been proclaimed. I mean, you think about thinking forward into the book of Joshua, how the people of Jericho have already heard about what God did for his own people in Egypt, and they're afraid. We do have evidence that the word of the Lord is being proclaimed. And I, I think that's a great connection. And I think the other part too, you know, that, that the Lord even provides for those who do not believe in him. It's a reminder of, say, the fourth petition, that God gives daily bread to everyone, even without our prayers, even to the unjust. Jesus speaks that way in Matthew 5. And it, it's a reminder that, in particular, in, in the context of the book of Deuteronomy and the world that was was there, it's a reminder that the Lord, that Yahweh, the God of Israel, isn't just some sort of tribal God taking care of just his people. Like you get this land and, and the gods of Edom are going to give their land and, and so forth. No, the God of the people of Israel, the Lord, he's the God over all people and he arranges all things. I mean, to see the, if I can use the term sovereignty of God over all, I, I think that's, and that should be good news in this context. It is good news. Yes. God is omnipotent. And as this text unfolds, yeah. we're going to see his omnipotence, is that even the borders, the territories, the land, it's all under God's watch, okay? That's and, right. You know, I'm glad you brought up his sovereignty because, uh, you know, we forget that too. We forget that too. Mm. Uh, you know, if the wrong politician, the wrong leader is in control, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? The church is going to get wiped out. Society is going to collapse, etc. Hey, Stop. What does God say? Be still and know that I am God. Okay. With just a breath, he can remove the tyrant. Um, I believe that's in Isaiah. But of course, he has these matters under his control. God is not panicking or worrying about, uh, you know, Russia invading Ukraine, and God doesn't know what to do about it. Okay. We may respond that way, but God knows exactly where the borders are going to fall, who's going to win the battle. Um, you know, the sword slays that person. And the next person, God knows all these things. And so I think Christians, I know the church should, should, should draw great comfort from that, that the heathen do not win. But things happen under God's control and his watch. And God, I mean, this passage from Romans 8, works all things for the good of those who love him is another promise we need to keep in mind as we, as we do live under an omnipotent God, but a God whose love for his people we see uh, not in his raw omnipotence, but his love is expressed in the work and person of his only begotten son. Very well said, Pastor Grotowitz. So the, the people of Israel, by the middle of verse 8, they've gone around and through the land of Edom. And next, we get a description about Moab. So we're moving north. Take us into the verses that talk about their, their time in and around Moab. Yeah, sure. So we, again, going to the map to have that perspective, we're going, there's Edom, and then north of Edom is Moab. So we're marching north. If, if you can picture this, we're going north. And if you're looking at a map, you are on the east side of of the Jordan River. So they're heading into Moab. Okay, we're going to hear plenty about Moab as we go through the Old Testament. But again, a similar a similar um, a word from our Lord when he tells them, don't harass or contend with them, for I will not give you any of their land for a possession. Because here it says, I've given R to the people of Lot for a possession. So R was a place in um, in Moab, and it, it's on my map. It's, if someone wants to look at it, it, it's it's fairly easy to find. But then verse 10, I want to comment. So we were talking about names earlier. The Emim formerly lived there, a people great and many and as tall as the Anakim. Now the Anakim, if you go back to Numbers, the Anakim are, um, are mentioned. That that's who the spies see when they go out and they spy on the land and they say... Let me, make, let me make a small correction. I just flip back to numbers. Actually, the spies say they claim they have seen the Nephilim. Now, that's a, uh, a group of people in Genesis chapter 6 who were supposed to be giants. The word Nephal um, is like to, to fall or fallen ones. And, and you may see that as they fall or they are ones making other people fall. But nonetheless, the Anakim are associated with the Nephilim. And the spies say we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. Uh, to them. So I'm reading from Numbers 13, 33 right there. Okay. The sons of Anak, yes, who come from the Nephilim. So according to scripture, I wanted to make sure I have that right. 
The Anakim are descendants of Nephilim. There are a great many people, and the Amim here um, are compared to them. So lots of big people, people of, of a gigantic stature. I mean, we, we, we don't have to rule that out. But on the term Amim, it, it, the, the etymology of that word, it means to frighten or to terrorize. So it comes from a Hebrew term meaning a ma. Okay. Well, it says they formerly lived there, okay, but not anymore. They're also uh, called the uh, Rephaim. That's in verse 11. Now, Rephaim comes from the Hebrew term meaning to heal. And on this, Luther compares them to any person who's great of great stature today who believes they can be the savior of the land or the healer of the land. And you might think about a politician that's just promising in the world, high up on a pedestal, making all of these promises. And, you know, that's kind of where Luther goes with the, the Rephaim. Again, coming from that Hebrew word to heal, meaning Rafa. Um, Anakim, there's also a name there. Anakim means something like um, they're a formidable people, to be sure, but it means like neck or chain or necklace, even Anak. Uh, and, and so if they're wearing necklaces and chains, maybe too we can deduce from that they thought they were a great and mighty people. Um, but even all that aside, even if you don't know Hebrew, the scriptures are, are clear enough to say it's, they're a great people. I'm, I'm talking about the Emim here. And they were many people. So a formidable foe, the Anakim, a formidable foe, the Rephaim, formidable people. Okay. Um, but, you know, they fall as great as these people are. And, and despite what they think they can and cannot do, um, you know, the Lord will get rid of them according to his good and gracious pleasure when and how he sees fit to do that. So, you know, in, in our modern modern day context, there are plenty of people who promise us all sorts of things. There are plenty of people who are great and powerful in our eyes. And especially uh, those people who are, you know, they are confessing heathen. They, they are confessing pagans. And yet it seems like the world is on their string and they are, they are um, you know, pulling all the right levers to make things fall in place for them and their agenda. Okay, we witness this. It is very frustrating. Hey, for the church, we are to be at peace, to relax. Let's go back to what we talked about earlier. God still reigns on his throne. God still sees how things are going to unfold. He knows how things are going to unfold for his people, whether it's the Amim, the Anakim, the Rephaim, some sort of powerful, prestigious, person making promises today, okay, but like any man, the prince falls, flesh and blood falls, and, you know, you know, the church lives here and now not looking for the promises of some, some ruler. I mean, we're told not to put our trust in princes, and so we live by that word, but we trust in our God to provide for us. So that, that's quite a bit of a mouthful, but I, I think all that is packed here in this text as they move into Moab, you know, Moses is recounting some of the great people who were there, but they aren't anymore because God has removed them. Hmm. So then as the, the ESV at least put some of those notes in parentheses, in verse 13, he comes back to what, what the Lord is telling to Moses. And, and as we start going forward, before they get to the land of Ammon, Moses is going to talk about a total of 38 years in the span of just a couple of verses. And he talks about how people died. What, what's there in verses 13 through 15? Sure. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, you're right. 38 years and just, you know, one or two, maybe three verses. But I think this is interesting. He says an entire generation, that is, the men of war had perished as the Lord had sworn to them. Okay. Two things. God swore this would happen and it did. God keeps his word when he says things are going to happen. They do. But also the men of war. Goodness, you would think now as you're traveling through these pagan territories, that's precisely the generation you want. The, the sword wielding people, uh, the people who can fight, the people who can win. But here they've perished. Okay. Well, let, let's hold it. Let, let's, you know, you slow down a little bit. Um, God does not need all the warriors to go conquer the likes of Moab or Ammon or the Canaanites. God is always the one who fights the battle. And so, you know, uh, once again, to the people of Israel, it would have looked like all the wrong people died. 
the men of war, my goodness. But God, God is, he's always impressing upon them. He is the one who saves. He is the one who's going to lead them. He is going to be the one who fights the battles. He is going to be the one who provides. And so by taking away the men of war, it's another lesson to them that their Lord and their God knows how to fight the battles and keep his promises, even when it seems that you know, the conditions and surroundings are saying the exact opposite. Hmm. Uh, the, the mention of the men of war in particular perishing here, I, I think it is very striking, particularly given the previous text. Back in chapter 1, verse 39, the Lord told the people, you know, you're not going to go in except for Caleb and Joshua and, and, and the little ones who the people thought would be the prey, the little ones get to go in <laughs> and the children who don't know anything. <laughs> like, those are the ones who get to go in. Here you have the the flip side of the, the men of war are going to perish. And again, just to remember who Moses is talking to at the moment, he's talking to the little ones and the children who are standing there in front of them. How are they standing there in front of them? Not because they fought their way there, but because the Lord carried them as his children. You know, the, what, a, what a wonderful thing. The, there's so much preaching material right here. Right. I mean, the children. So in numbers, they had made a comment. Oh, our children will be prey. They're going to die. You know, this comment of despair. And we, we've touched upon that stuff. But, you know, so here you have the weakest of society. They're the ones who are going to get in okay, while the men of war are perishing. Now, I think a lot of that, man, we see in the Lord's words, I mean, a popular verse, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for theirs is the kingdom of God. God sparing the children, God saving the children, God bringing the children into the promised land um, without them having to fight the battles and do all the work. Um, you know, the gospel proclamation teaches us the same in this sense that, you know, faith is something that God gives. He works it in the heart. If you are an infant hearing upon the word of God, we should trust in God's promise that faith comes by hearing. God is the giver of the faith. He sustains the faith. Um, and, you know, we can make another comparison to somebody sitting on their deathbed about to die. You know, speak the word, proclaim the word. The pastor can come in, proclaim that mighty word and trust in the Holy Spirit to do his work according to his good and gracious pleasure. Point being, you know, salvation is monergistic. It is what God does. And here, I mean, we're seeing an example of this, of God once again, um, you know, saving the weak, saving the lowly. The children, the ones that we think in our minds are going to be the prey, it's the exact opposite. The adults are the ones who are going to, their bodies are going to hit the floor and the children are going to receive that promised inheritance of this of this great land. So it, it's a fascinating text, um, a, a reversal as, as you, uh, as you, as you might, um, think where, you know, what looks like to our eyes should happen doesn't. And I, I think another New Testament passage that talks about that would be first Corinthians one, where, uh, mm -hmm. Paul is writing to the Corinthians and talks about God working through, working through the weak to shame, the strong working through what is foolish to bring down that, which we think is wise. Of course, I'm, I'm paraphrasing that, but I would encourage a listener to go read chapter one uh, of first Corinthians to, to hear God working backwards what we think, working through the weak and lowly things to bring down the high and lofty things in our minds. To demonstrate again, he is not reliant upon strength as we see strength or power as we see power. He can do the work if it's a child, the weak, the lowly. It is, it's no obstacle to our God. Well, and it is precisely for those people that he does rescue. Whereas if you are the the strong one, the one who thinks he's strong, then that's the one that gets broken down. I mean, think about the the Magnificat. This is the way Mary sings, and this is precisely what the people are, are experiencing here in the wilderness, that it is these, these children who had no experience in war, they're the ones that are about to go into the promised land, whereas the men of war, they died in the wilderness. And and. Moses makes the point, just as the Lord had spoken, that this, again, is a, although it, it is a verse of judgment against those who did not believe, yet there is promise here as well, because in, in the Lord keeping his promise, he did what he said. Here's another example to this new generation about to go in the promised land, that the Lord is faithful. He is faithful in his judgment. That means he's also going to be faithful in his salvation. That, that's something I think we should pick up from this verse as well. Without question. Without question. And, and so when God says he is going to send 
you know, unbelievers, unbelievers to hell. Okay. And that declaration, uh, we will not be able to thwart. And it's a declaration we all need to hear because we all struggle with sin and we all have to battle the flesh. And so that, that word of God in the New Testament about saving, saving those who believe, but rejecting and condemning those who do not, we see that here. He, he swore to them that they would perish, and they did. You know, another lesson that God does keep what he says. He does not go back on his word. And that's a continual lesson for us because, as I mentioned earlier on the front part of this, we're very quick to forget uh, what our Lord has said. And all of us are prone to turning away because we battle that sinful flesh that hears what God says and thinks, ah, well, it won't happen to me. I'll be okay. I'll talk my way out of it. No big deal. Just a little sin here and there. You know, what? what's to it? You know, that's where that's where our sinful flesh always wants to go. So a lesson like this, um, this, this, this penalty of the law for these men of war, you know, that, that's a penalty that we, we, we want to hear and take seriously because our flesh gets lazy and slothful. And pretty soon we think the penalties just don't apply to us and, and we can live how we want. As the text moves into verses 16 through the end, then we come to the rest of the journey that we get in the text. They've been in Moab. They're going to leave Moab. And again, this is after the 38 years. They're going to go now to the territory of the people of Ammon. Uh, what's what's there as they begin that journey farther north? Yeah, more repetition. Uh, so in the people of Ammon, they're heading, they're, they're continuing their track northward. Again, uh, they are told, don't harass them or contend with them, because here... This uh, land, it says, uh, I have given it to the sons of Lot, sons of Lot for possession. And it's also counted as a land of the Rephaim. Now, I commented on the Rephaim, but here uh, it goes on. I'm in verse 20. The Rephaim formerly lived there, but the Ammonites called them the Zamzumim, a people great and many and tall as the Anakim. So we've had the Amim. We've seen the Rephaim, um, the Anakim, and here the Rephaim is called the Zamzumim. And again, all great, large people. We don't know a great deal about them, but I think we can get the point. They're a big, formidable people, okay? Um, probably big in size, big in stature. I mean, Goliath was a Philistine um, who, was, who was large, we know. But the Zamzumim, I want to comment on that word. Um, one commentary said it, the Zamzumim meant uh, something like like to talk gibberish. But the lexicons I looked at on that, along with Luther, says these are people that exhibited some sort of a sort of bad, frightening, terrifying behavior. When I looked up, looked up Zama in my lexicon, um, this is what I found, which I, I think is interesting. Zama means something like infamy, shameful behavior, even fornication and incest. And so Zama being the root word of this uh, Zamzu meme. So a people great and many, it could be that they are also um, you know, a group of people living a heathen lifestyle and committing really just shameful atrocities. Um, and, you know, that would make sense as you go on in 21, it says the Lord destroyed them before the Ammonites and they uh, dispossessed them and settled in their place. So it, it, it does sound like all the evidence is pointing to this was a sinful, sinful people that ultimately falls under the Lord's destruction that he works to the Ammonites who dispossesses them. So um, that's what's going on at that juncture. Uh, 22. Uh, again, more reiteration, as he did for the people of Esau, okay, who lived in Seir, when he destroyed the Horites before them. Now, again, he destroyed. Again, we see God working here, don't we? He may use people to do it, but, I mean, it says he destroys the Horites before them, and they dispossessed them and settled in their place. You know, God does take care of the wicked, okay? And, you know, this goes back to what I was just saying about um Sending, sending to hell those who reject his promises, those who live in unbelief, and they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And they would rather live sinful, shameful lives outside of God and his word. Well, destruction, hell, I mean, these are the consequences. These are the punishments that we're seeing even right here in this text with God punishing and destroying those people who want no part of him. So I think I've talked through uh, 22. Let me just go ahead and catch 23 here. Then you have the Avim, 
And these people, it says, live in villages as far as Gaza. So Gaza is on, uh, if you look on a map, Gaza is on the, the border of the land of Canaan. And it, it's a port city. It's right by the Mediterranean. And the Kaftorim, um, there, there's evidence that does suggest those are the people, the forefathers of the great Philistines. And I mean, I mentioned uh, Goliath earlier. We're going to get plenty of the Philistines as the Old Testament narrative unfolds. So, um, but the verse does say the Avim, they lived in villages, but the Kaphorim who came from Kaphtor destroyed them and settled in their place. So we don't know a whole lot about the Avim. You know, the, the note I have here, it was one of the cities of the tribe of Benjamin. It is mentioned in Joshua 18. Um, but the uh, Kaphtorim, if it is right that they are the people of the Philistines, and we can see here at least a hint of their destructive and warlike nature. nature. Um, and so that takes us through 23, but I'm sure there's some things we want to uh, circle back and, and talk more about. Well, just briefly, we have about four minutes here. So briefly, we talked about Moab and Ammon, and then Edom was the first one. I, I think many Christians know the account of Jacob and Esau. Uh, both Moab and Ammon are said to be related to Lot. Can you give us just a brief rundown of, of how how these two people are related to the Israelites? Yeah, I can I can give it a shot here. So for Ammon, according to Hebrew tradition, this is what I, I looked up, they are the descendants of Ben Amni, the son of Lot by his daughter. And the reference I wrote down to that would have been Genesis 19, 30 through 38. Um, so that, that's from Ammon. And who was the other one that you, you made? Well, and then, and then Moab would be Ben Ami's half brother and cousin at the same time okay. because it's lot has the two the two daughters who both have children after they escape from Sodom and Gomorrah they think they're the last people on earth basically and and they're ready to to help repopulate through and that, that may be a slight exaggeration but they're afraid the family name is going to die out and so they have children with their father and so Moab is the the half brother of Ben Ami. Right. Okay. So I think there's our connection then. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that account where, yeah, the daughters want to kind of take it upon themselves and, you know, right. reader can go explore that. So, yeah. So an, an, an incestual relationship here and you know, look, the lineage I'll make, I know we're short on time, but you, you, when you look at the lineage leading up to Jesus, my goodness, it's a messy lineage right. and there are sinful people. But again, God works through these things to bring about good he brings about Christ and uh, that glorious gospel that we live by. That's right. And and it is from, you know, Moab. Ruth is from Moab. She finds her way into the, the genealogy of Jesus. So even through the, the sinful acts of men, the Lord is at work to bring the Savior into the world, even, even there. And, and again, Lot, the father of these two, he's the nephew of Abraham. And so you see God being gracious to someone because of, on account of the promise he made to Abraham. Again, you see God's God's faithfulness throughout this. So with about two minutes, Pastor Agrotowitz, help us to wrap things up a lot here in Deuteronomy 2. Lots of history, crazy names. Uh, what should we take from this as Christians? Right. I think we've only scratched the surface, but what we take from this as Christians is one, God provides for his people. That's the big thing that jumps out at me. God work. He works through the sinful. He works through the lowly. He can work through the despised um, to bring about good and wonderful things. God provides for his people. He takes care of his people. God will get his people where to go. Where they, where they are going, where he wants them to go. You know, so for the Christian, the church living today, let's keep that perspective. Okay. God knows where we are going. He has prepared a place for his people and the people of God, those who were redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ and his crimson blood, have an inheritance even right now that is imperishable. It's one in heaven, secured by God in Christ. And man, even when it seems like we are in a wilderness and everything is collapsing, hey, be of be of good cheer and rejoice. It is always God's good pleasure to give you his kingdom, and you have it in Jesus, so fear not. Uh, you know where you're going, and you even know the way to get there. His name is Jesus. Pastor Ryan Agrotowitz is associate pastor and headmaster at Grace Lutheran Church and School in Brenham, Texas, helping us today with Deuteronomy 2, verses 1 to 23. Pastor Agrotowitz, thanks for being our guest today. Anytime, Pastor Apple. Thank you so much for having me. The Lord is faithful to his promises. He provides for his people, even in the wilderness. The children of Israel entering into the promised land can have that confidence, and so can you and I as we await our Lord's return. I am your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about Deuteronomy chapter 2, send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. We always love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. 
Talk to you again tomorrow.